So, uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Ted Rao. I am a co-founder and operational leader of Sociocracy for All. Sociocracy for All is an organization, a nonprofit, um, operating globally, and we um, support training. We support creation and spreading of content about sociocracy, communities of practice, and we want to help people have access to sociocratic governance as one of the forms of governance that help people make decisions mm -hmm. as equals without, as I say in my shortcut, without driving each other too crazy. Um, you should know enough about Zoom. So this um, is Theo and I'm totally thrilled to have you because this for me has been on my mind for a long time, not only because we've known each other for a while, we only live 25 minutes apart, drive, five minutes drive apart. So we've seen in, each other in person um, a few times, that was always fun. And all the topics that we kept talking about sort of bounce around in my head quite a bit. And uh, the one pressing question where I always, like that I'm always asked, where I always go, I should have Theo about that one, is the question of, Okay, sociocracy sounds great, but can anybody do that? Is that for everybody? And since we'll call it sociocracy for all, which when we found it so far, sociocracy for all, was more with the background of people in different industries, you know, for-profit, non-profit, communities, whatever, different financial backgrounds and different areas of, of the world. That was our background. But how, what do we do if it's not for all? Because simply not everybody can do it for whatever reason that might be. So that was always a little bit of a nagging feeling in me of like, are we re, can, we, can we keep what we're promising there? So, and if not, what could we do about it? And so all of those, this, this whole sort of soup of questions was on my mind, um, has been on my mind for a long time. So here you are. And I would love for you to introduce yourself because I'm sure you can do that better than I could. And um, let me just say something about the structure of how we're gonna do this and then you totally have the stage. And that is, um, so there's a little bit of presentation and then I assume that there will be a little bit of conversation between the two of us. But people can feed me questions in the Q&A tool, not in the chat, um, that I will try to work in and then about, I'm guessing, about an hour in, maybe just 45 minutes, depends on how things go, we will be able to take people from the audience, bring them into this, this Zoom room and have more conversation type thing um, happening here. Okay, so that's how we're going to go. So now to you, your introduction and what you brought for us. Thank you for being here. Ah, well, I'm going to keep the introduction down to a minimum, I think, because um, I, I think you were sent a link to an, uh, an article that I wrote that kind of explains the whole trajectory. But, but I will, especially for those of you who might not have had a chance to take a look, just say that, you know, many, many years ago when I was practicing midwifery in Canada, I welcomed about 500 babies into the world and watched them grow up. And one of the things that I noticed when I was doing that work was that every single child learned to walk. And really, it, it, we don't take that as something remarkable because it happens to just about everybody or at least everybody who's well enough to do so. But one of the things that I really noticed about this phenomenon was that they were learning to do something extremely difficult and painful, and they seemed to be addicted to doing it. And I thought, so what happens to us? Why is it that as we get older, that many of us use that passion and, and no longer behave as though we're addicted to learning? It seemed really terrible to me if it was possible that we were doing something as a culture that was actually taking that passion away from us. It, to me, it was like stealing our life force from us. And at that time, I became interested in education and, and actually used my interest only to educate my own children the way that I thought they should be educated. But later, as they grew up, I went back to university and I decided that I was going to pursue this question and try to figure out if there was a way that we could make it so that our educational system preserved that passion and, um, and helped us to learn in ways that were more useful in helping us to engage the world. 
So that happened, uh, you know, that, that entry into the academic world happened back in the 1990s. And since then, I've been working on trying to solve that problem through uh, building learning tools that would basically support teachers and students in learning optimally, learning in a way that, that the brain likes to learn. And I'd like to share that with you today and talk about its relationship to sociocracy. And of course, I'll be willing to answer those other questions that Ted raised earlier as well. So um, I've prepared a, a set of slides. It's really short, I promise. I don't want to spend very much time here. Um, just being a, a, a talking head, I'd really love to have an opportunity to engage everyone. But I do want to explain why I would you know, suggest such a a wild and crazy title as why the brain loves sociocracy. Uh, because to me, um, as someone who works with sociocracy in, in my organization, um, but also as someone who went searching for something that would adapt itself to our way of thinking about learning and, and human interaction in the workplace, uh, one of the things that struck me very early on was that there was a lot of parallels between what we were trying to do for learning and what sociocracy is trying to do for human engagement in, in um, the workspace. So the first thing I want to talk ab about here is just the nature of knowledge and learning. Um, just to, it's a kind of orientation. So if it seems irrelevant at first, um, bear with me for a little while. So we're really focused here in my organization on helping to build knowledge and skills that are a, are the kinds of knowledge and skills we need to, to act in the real world, to engage the real world. And the kind of knowledge I'm talking about is often called usable knowledge. So rather than um, learning in a, in a way that is, okay, now it's doing it again. Oh, okay. I think I, I've got what it's going to let me do. So instead of, of, of thinking of knowledge as stuff that you remember because it's gotten into your brain, you've tried to memorize it, um, we don't think of knowledge in that way at all. We actually, and, and in fact, you know, knowledge really isn't stuff and the brain is nothing like a container. Yes. In reality, um, knowledge is a representation of, a, of dynamic connections between neurons in our brains and the arrangement and rearrangement of certain molecules within neurons. So knowledge is, is a, dynamic, it's not um, static uh, facts or you know, static um, formulas. It's actually a dynamic process in which many ideas are bumping up against one another all the time. It's about connection and communication, not stuff. And ideally, if we're learning optimally, knowledge is going to be constructed through what we think of as moment-to-moment -moment reflective interactions with our social and physical environments. So think about those babies that I watched learning. That was a process that was governed by an interaction between the child and the environment, a constant, ongoing, iterating interaction between the child and the environment. And this process operates in the brain as a way of progressively deepening, deepening and connecting our brains so that we, we, we have enriched understandings of the world around us if we learn in this way. So what that means is that learning is about building usable knowledge and it requires that we learn optimally. Um, and in a way, in, and, and in a sense, this is actually learning the way the brain wants to learn. And when we do learn this way, what happens is we build knowledge that's more robust, that is more useful to us, that we're not going to forget, that's usable, we can apply it, we can work with it, we can share it with other people, and that's embodied. It's knowledge that we have to our core. So we don't just know things in a, an intellectual way, but we know them emotionally. We know them in a connected way. Um, and it makes knowledge a much more alive and fascinating place to be than if you've just memorized a bunch of facts. And that's the superior way of knowing that I was talking about earlier. So high quality learning isn't possible, in fact, it turns out, unless we set the right kind of learning goals. And what I mean by that is that what we're learning should be just difficult enough to be challenging, 
but not so difficult that failure is always inevitable. There's a lot of things that are like this, not just knowledge. So we call that the zone in which the learning challenge is just right, the Goldilocks zone. And learning in the zone triggers a cycle in the brain called the dopamine opioid cycle. And here's where we get into talking about why those babies acted like they were addicted. Because the dopamine opioid cycle is actually the same cycle in our brain that we associate with all forms of addiction. And in many respects, it's the, learning is the original intended purpose of this cycle, being able to learn in a, in, a, in a challenging environment. So here's how it works. I'm still getting lots of, whoops, back, let me go back. Okay, so here's just a really kind of short, quick um, way of thinking about how the dopamine opioid cycle, cycle works. So when, it, when we're learning, um, the dopamine opioid cycle um, wants us to start with some kind of goal. So we, we, have to have, we have to be fired up by some goal. We have to have some kind of challenge that we're trying to meet or some kind of something that, we're, that we really wanna learn that's really interesting and looks juicy to us and we're excited about. Um, and that hap it, it, it happens that when we have a goal of that kind, that the do dopamine is released in our brain and makes us want to strive to learn. So you know, for a child, it's despite the fact that they just fell down, they, the feedback that they've gotten from the falling down has given them um, just what they need to set a goal that, you know, that's going to cause the dopamine to be released in their brain and make them willing to work really hard to achieve the next level of, of their goal towards learning to walk. So, you know, a child's gonna set that goal just right automatically, and it's done completely unconsciously, just right for them, and, and that varies from person to person. Um, adults often, you know, have to do that more consciously. And this cycle will keep going and releasing the dopamine and then rewarding us when we have success with opioids, as long as we keep the challenge just right. But if it becomes to our environment becomes too easy for us, then it gets turned off and we lose it. And if our environment becomes too difficult for us, it gets turned off. So if we fail too often, it stops working properly. And if we succeed too often, it stops working properly. So we have a kind of built in mechanism that, that helps us to set the goal just right, to make us want to strive towards something that's just beyond our reach. And because this is such a powerful mechanism in the brain, it makes sense to organize learning around the mechanism rather than trying to bypass the mechanism and come up with other ways of motivating people to learn. So over the last hundred years or so, people have come up with a number of different models for learning that resemble what you see here, which is what we call V-call or the virtuous cycle of learning, where learning, um, engagements are governed by this process of setting a learning goal, gathering information, then applying what you've learned, reflecting on the outcome and setting another learning goal. And when we do this consciously, we start to reconnect with the dopamine opioid cycle. And one of the things that we work on, we're working on right now is helping adults reconnect with their dopamine opioid cycles. M many adults have lost their connection to the cycle because of problems um, encountered during their education their formal education. So this should be starting to look a little bit familiar to you guys by now, but just in case it's not, let's think about it in terms of decision making. So one of the things that um, sociocracy is well known for is dynamic um, decision making process, where in which you set a goal, gather information, make a decision, measure outcomes, and then iterate. And I would argue that if you think about it for very long, you'll, you'll think of several processes within sociocracy that are governed in the same way. And that if sociocracy is done just right, <laughs> that it becomes addictive because your brain loves doing processes like this, especially when you get those, that goal setting just right and you're getting the, the decision-making chunk size just right. So I have sort of this I, I call it my little research project um, for myself. And that is, um, why are some meetings fun and why are some meetings not fun? 
And the answer that I came up with for myself was um, there is sort of the together aspect of, well, we were actually all on the same page enough to have a sense of um, shared reality enough. And we stretched, so it was hard, you know, but in this good sense kind of hard. And the other one is forward motion, having a sense of we actually accomplished something, just stretching. I don't know, maybe that's just me. I know that it, I'm extremely biased towards forward motion. To me, forward motion is, um, there must be another, another sort of chemical reaction in my brain that I'm very suspect, susceptible to. Um, but could you say something about that? Is that um, sort of, or, yeah, I'm sure you have a response um, to, to what I just said. <laughs> There's probably a number of different ways to approach this and, you know, make me come at it again if I am not answering your question. But one of the things I realized as a facilitator, maybe a year into learning how to be a good facilitator, sociocratic facilitator, um, was that in some sense it became my responsibility <laughs> to try to help make that happen. To try to ensure that in the planning process for meetings that we weren't biting off more than we could chew that we were really aware of where people were, where they were coming from, you know, what's the level of stress right now in this team, given, you know, what's coming at us and, um, you know, what, it, what, how much can we handle? And also paying attention to what people really just loved to do and making sure that we always did some of the stuff that I knew that people loved to do. But my team loved brainstorming. And so we would often split up the hard work with opportunities to brainstorm simply, simply so that if we were struggling with something that was a bit beyond us, that we wouldn't have a, a general feeling about that meeting that we hadn't moved forward. That there, would be a, there would be enough in the meeting to take us forward feeling like we'd made progress and, and, in, and, you know, and enjoyed ourselves in the process. I see, so that will be a consideration that goes into agenda planning, not only you know, what needs doing, but also how can we create a mix so that everybody walks away from the meeting saying like, okay, some things needed to be done, but overall it was fun because we move things forward in a way that challenged us just enough. So that, and with tools that we enjoy doing. So even if, if we don't, if, we, if it's not a sure win in terms of process, at least we're doing something that, 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 that what needs, hmm. help me finish my sentence. So something that, it gets us in the Goldilocks zone. <laughs> that's the way I think about it. Like we need enough stuff that keeps us in the Goldilocks zone. I and mean, people can handle a certain amount of, you know, stress and distress that goes beyond what's really tolerable or it's going to keep us in flow. But, and we can handle a certain amount of boredom. But if we're in those states too much of the time, then we, we stop being productive, we stop being happy, we stop being engaged. So if you want to keep those things happening, that there's, there is a, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a set of skills that we need to learn as, as facilitators and participants that will help us to, to create the, the environment they would like the meeting to be. Um, so, you know, I, I, when I first started learning sociocracy, there were a whole lot of patterns to learn and processes to learn. But every single one of the steps in every single one of those processes and patterns was also a skill that had to be learned or a set of skills that had to be learned. And, it, you know, I thought we were going to be able to just start out being really good at this thing <laughs> because we had the right mindset. We were definitely oriented toward this, the kind of model that sociocracy represents in multiple ways. But we all had a long journey of skill building. And, I, and I, I feel like if someone had prepared us for that a little better, there would have been some stumbles that didn't feel so horrible. You know, they said, look, you've got to learn skills to do this. This is not something that just comes naturally, especially in a culture and an education where, where we have educational system that teaches us none of these skills. Yes. You know, we're building them as adults for the first time or trying to relearn things that we, don't, we haven't really known since we were babies. So it's a big task. It's a big ask of people to get them involved in processes where they haven't brought that skill set already fully, you know, developed into the, into the sessions. Mm -hmm. um, well, then I had one question about sort of inhibitors. So I hear, you know, boredom as an inhibitor, like that, that gets sort of out of, us out of the flow, being stretched too far. Mm -hmm. 
one thing that I would love to hear opinion on that I observe is lack of clarity is incredibly stressful for people of like, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? You know, like what, like, can you say more about that? Because that seems to be something that um, comes up quite a bit. Lack of clarity is, is, um, isn't it a problem in almost any context? <laughs> I can't think of anything that's more frustrating than not really having a shared understanding of what you're doing. Uh, I, I don't, I, I can't speak to all of the sources of lack of clarity or all of the reasons that they might occur, but I could talk about one of them. And that is, the, you know, based upon the developmental work that we do, where the, you know, we study how people learn things over time and how people come to understand things over time and how they build skills over time. And people think differently at different points along that journey in whatever area or domain or um, context that they find themselves in. If, when you bring together a team of people, it's likely that you're going to have a group of people who are actually understanding the concepts you're talking about in different ways. And the implications of that are profound. And I think we, we often think that, well, this person's not um, on the same page as me because they disagree with me. Well, that might be true but they may disagree with you because you're not talking about the same thing. You're using the same words, but you're not talking about the same thing. So one of the things that we tried to do in our organization was try to make sure that we actually were on the same. We didn't take that for granted. Mm. We, you know, we try to check in and see if we really are talking about the same thing. Like, are we using this word in the same way? So that's one of the ways that you can increase clarity within a meeting setting. And when it happens that there are people thinking in different ways, you need to stop. You know, you need to stop and try to help everybody get closer to being on the same page. So that when, you, when, you know, when you're having a conversation about something, that to the extent possible, you are talking about the same things. There's another piece to that, and that is that that's only possible up to a point. So if you have a team that's composed of people who are thinking really too differently, and for example, if someone's got years of development before they're gonna think about that idea the same way that somebody else does on a team, that can make a team really difficult to work in for, those, for the people who are that far apart because they just can't really understand each other and it's gonna be, you know, be a long time before they can, um, even normally learning and building skill in the normal fashion. So I know that this, um, I've just started glancing at questions in, in the Q&A because I'm still sitting of one of mine. Hold on. Um, so I, I have one, one very sort of specific question and that is, so we often, one of the cycles is meeting evaluations, right? So we do, we do the lead to measure um, sort of planning, carrying out, evaluating cycle, for example, on policy level, but we also do it on meeting level. So the meeting mm -hmm. evaluation is so that the next meeting will be better in some way. So now listening to you, I'm thinking, huh, I should focus more on just providing the level of ideas of our oh, next time we could that are sort of in that just right zone, right? And the Goldilocks zone of this is some that, that if I, if I could hit the sweet spot of what people are willing to stretch and willing and able to stretch to, that would be more promising and maybe would make it more fun because then people might get more excited about, Hey, this is something we could try and that would make it better. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I think you're describing what it is that I have, that I strive to do in my or own organization. And I have to say, it's hard. Hmm. You know, it's hard enough for us to learn how to do this for ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if we don't recognize the feelings ourselves, you know, if we don't know, if, for example, if we don't know what it feels like to really understand something or to have a shared understanding, yeah. um, that, that in and of itself can get in the way of being able to accomplish that goal. So there's, there's many factors that play a role. And, you know, that just, you know, I mean, to me, it just, you know, you know, puts an exclamation point behind. There's lots to learn. You know, there are a lot of skills that need to be learned along the way. And recognizing where the misunderstandings are com coming from, where people are in alignment and truly in alignment, and not just being polite, where um, the fear of, appearing not to understand gets in the way. For example, you know, we've been doing research on uh, emotion in learning contexts. 
And we've discovered that a lot of adults, perhaps the majority of adults, have a lot of very negative emotions around not understanding that include as prominent shame and embarrassment and emotions that really get in the way of being able to not, to, you know, to stop just nodding like you do understand because you don't want to be seen as the person who doesn't understand. So there's just so many things that have, you, have, you have to be aware of to be able to kind of uncover the issues. And then each of the issues requires a certain, um, you know, requires its own kind of nuanced way of approaching it. Yeah, continue to be humbled by, by what we're trying to do together, right? <laughs> Any kind of group process, it's just, it's just so mind blowing how complex it is because what comes up for me right now and listening to you is the sort of, there is a certain, what I describe as visceral feeling of this feels good because I'm in alignment with myself, we're aligned, I have a sense that we're understanding each other. Or for example, what I think about a lot of what does consent feel like? You know, being in consent is, um, is more a feeling than something in your head because you know when something is just off and having the courage then to speak up while you're being confused and a little like being the person, yeah, anyway, speaking, speaking up while you're not quite clear with yourself yet. Then there's the, squ the skill level. And then we haven't even talked about just the processes, knowing the ins and outs. And that's just the process, right? We haven't done any of our work yet that we actually get together to do. So that's, that's just right. insane, the level of, of complexity. Yeah, I mean, this is why our mission is a K-12 mission, because these are skills we should have been learning all our lives. We should be coming to these meetings with these skills intact already. They're the skills we need for life. They are the fundamental skills we need for life in, in, in these complex, changing times. Um, so if we don't start developing them in our children, it, adults will forever find themselves in this position where they have this huge skill set to learn that really should just be part of so deeply ingrained in you that indeed it is something you feel. <laughs> you know, it's embodied deeply in us that it becomes something that you feel. And instead, what we do see is people learn it as grown-ups while still unlearning behavior and, you know, relearning behavior while dealing with a trauma from not having experienced and not having had good experiences. Right. Right. So that's a lot at the same time. No wonder so much gets stirred up in the process. Yeah. And we do call it trauma. Do you want to say more about trauma? Because trauma is something that I have sort of a hot topic for me all the time. I find it. I, many of the adults that I meet have been traumatized by their education. Mm. Do you want to say by not being allowed to learn the way their brain wants to learn and being forced to learn in ways that they know are not productive. I mean, how many kids come home and say, I'm just going to forget it after I do the test. The kids know this or the list of vocabulary terms they have to memorize that they know they're not going to be using next year because they don't need them. <laughs> you know, there's no burning desire to have that meaning yet. Um, we, we waste their time. Half of them are at the bottom of the class, which means they're being punished for learning, getting low grades, right, all the time. And, ha and most of them are memorizing because there's not enough time to understand. So they're being deprived of un even understanding, much less being able to take the knowledge and go and put it to work in the world. So we starve their brains <laughs> for all of these years and, and, and punish them for learning or, or punish them if they don't get the high, high grades, right? So if you keep getting A's, your, your parents pat you on the back. And if you don't get an A, you don't get patted on the back. You've got to pass the test to get into college. So even the kids who are succeeding in this system are being traumatized in one way, and the kids that aren't succeeding are being traumatized in another way. But we're all traumatized in the sense that we've had this way of learning that we're born with that works really well, basically taken away from us during that process. I'm a little passionate about this. Hmm. <laughs> That's, That's why you're here. That's why I'm still here after 21 years. <laughs> so if you're willing, I'd look at questions that people asked and um, it's hard for me to multitask and sort of really read them all and look at the perfect, um, perfect order of things. Um, I'm just gonna start at the top and try and, and get, a, get a handle on things. Okay. Um, how can, I guess, we set a goal that our brain will love to work on? Yeah, that's a good one. So tell us more about that. How well, it really, yeah, it depends 
on you as an individual to some extent. Um, if, um, if you've still got that, if, if you still have that ability to feel what feels right, what feels good, what feels interesting, then I would just start with, start there. Uh, you know, I, I talked about the Goldilocks zone earlier and intentionally I talked about it in a vague kind of way because it's different for different people, but it's usually associated with this feeling. If, you're, if you've got enough familiarity with it, um, the, thing, the, next, the, the thing that is going to stretch you feels juicy rather than scary, or if it feels scary, it feels scary juicy. <laughs> um, um, and, and the difficulty level of it, and don't let anybody else's idea of what the difficulty level ought to be impede you here. The difficulty level of it should feel just right to you. It should feel like, okay, yeah, there's a good chance I can succeed at this. Not, I'm definitely going to succeed at this, but there's a good chance. Now, some people, and these are the people that we call the, the people who managed to stay addicted to learning, even though they were educated in this school system. Um, those people sometimes have these really wide Goldilocks zones where they're, they're willing to take on a task that it might take them like a year to succeed at right and they're willing to muck around for a long time and not be sure and not understand and um and are perfectly happy there but most people have a much narrower zone than that and some people who've been who've got more trauma associated with learning have a very narrow goldilocks zone so they're not going to take too much of a risk to start with until they start to get that good feeling about not understanding that that uh, the addicted people have so i would pay attention to just those 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 two signals like is it does it feel challenging? Does it feel cool? Does it feel like it's something desirable? And that would be the first step toward learning to recognize the Goldilocks zone. And we, one of the things that we're trying to build are these assessments, these little assessments that help people to, to figure out what those things are so they can get started down that path. But many people can do this for themselves if they're just paying attention. And then sort of what follows from that is a question here from, from the Q&A uh, tool. How, and so how do you deal with the heterogeneity of the group in a meeting? Um, so yes. Different for different people. And at the same time, what if you don't know? That's the next question. If you're walking into a situation where you don't know what the level is. So maybe you can wow. take it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, if you're work, if you're walking in a situation where you don't know, you spend a lot of time listening at first, like you just have to listen a lot and really hear what people are saying and try to really hear into what they're meaning by what they're saying to get a lay of the land. Um, yes, in my organization, I deal with heterogeneity in a couple of ways. One is that I want to ensure that every team is heterogeneous in the sense that people have different kinds of expertise. But I try to keep it more homogeneous in the sense of, do they have a, are they able to have a shared understanding? So I think the shared understanding piece, not agreement, I don't mean agreement by that, but I mean that most of the time when we're talking about the issues that face us, that we are understanding that our field of view is similar to one another, like how much of the problem we can see is similar to one another. Um, and some of that has to do with how, you know, how, how complex people's thinking is relative to the problems and issues that you're confronting as a team. So in our, in our organization, um, we, you know, we try to make sure that the teams have a, a certain amount of heterogeneity and that the, in that the heter but the heterogeneity is about different expertise so that when you come together you're building knowledge together um, but not too much of the kind that makes it difficult to communicate with one another does that make sense makes a lot of sense and it seems hard to do because first of all then there's you know there's the question of assessment sort of how do you how do you harvest that information so that you can even assemble it in that way <clears throat> it's it this is a very difficult question 
<laughs> well, is it in your just it's right? It's a very difficult <laughs> question, you know, in, in society today in particular, this is a really difficult question. We, I, I think that there is a strong tendency for us to want to believe that everybody's the same. And that we think that that's the, the way that we give respect to one another as human beings is by is by making this assumption that we're all the same, we're all equal, we're all equally capable, we're all on the same page, you know, we're all able to get to the same page. Um, one of the reasons that our education system has failed so abysmally is because we put all five-year-olds in the same group together because of that desire to be fair. So in our, in our desire to be fair, we're creating a situation in which, you know, there are kids that are bored to tears and there are kids that are suffering from never being able to succeed. And is we're creating a, a, a terrible situation for many children to, to have to survive through. Um, so it, it's this is a you know there there are huge questions about fairness and goodness and what it means to respect other human beings and what equity and equality are and how we how much we want to recognize our difference, how much we're willing to even think about recognizing our difference. Um, I I confronted a few years ago that you're not allowed to use the word average if you're talking about students in schools. Like it's a dirty word. Um, so now we have, we have hundreds of words now that we're not allowed to say. You know, in my lifetime, the number of words we're not allowed to say has grown exponentially. <laughs> the, kind of number, the kinds of thoughts we're not supposed to have. So with something like sociocracy, where we're trying to create a level playing field in many respects, or a more level playing field, um, the question of some people having more of something than others have, especially if, if it comes to something like that smacks of intelligence, becomes a really difficult conversation to have. Yeah. We have to be brave. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I, said we have to, I said we have to be brave if we want to confront those kinds of questions. Yeah. <clears throat> There are three questions that are very similar that I would like um, to bundle here. Now, well, basically they're all skills. So the skills that one needs to know or have in body, whatever, um, before, to, before one can do sociocracy or that kids could learn to, to um, pick it up well. Um, say more about those skills. Oh, so, well, the skills, I, I think, let me see, I'm gonna name, I, I'm gonna name only a few of them. Um, I'll start with interpersonal skills. There's a whole set of interpersonal skills, like active listening, for example, being able to really listen to other people, being able to um, recognize when you understand something, when you don't understand something, you know, um, <laughs> um, building, you know, the the reflex of, of asking when you don't understand rather than pretending to understand when you don't understand. Um, skills for coordinating perspectives. So skills for taking someone else's perspective and your perspective and being able to find where you have commonalities and where you have differences and begin to bring those perspectives together to form a solution. Now I would argue that sociocracy is not only requiring these skills but it's building these skills. So it's got this, this really, the strong aspect to it is it's, a, it's the perfect incubator for these skills, as well as being a place that needs them from you. Um, other skills would be skills for, well, obviously skills for collaboration, which include the ability to, to understand within a particular moment. Yeah, I think you've written about this, not framed in this way, but understand in a particular context how much collaboration should be happening. You know, when, when is it appropriate to be making decisions together by consent? When is it appropriate to be making a, a decision more autocratically because consent's already been obtained adequately for that purpose? Um, so those are, those are profoundly challenging skills to develop over time. I always think of um, musicians and athletes when I think of skill building. You know, if, you, if you're an athlete, no one ever says, okay, memorize this and you'll have it. <laughs> What you do is every day you go out and you practice and you stretch each skill. You know, you figure out which one's the next one that needs to be stretched and your trainer helps you figure that out and you build the skills together up, 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 and you never stop because there's no apex, there's no end. 
music, being doing music is the same way. Any kind of skill is like that. So you can think of these as a process of building some kind of virtuosity. It's an art of building skill. Um, another kind of skill that you need are just the process skills. So building skills for, in, for enacting the processes of sociocracy um, and understanding how they, you know, how the pieces fit together and how to enact those processes. I mean, just, you know, how do you, how do you build a, an ideal um, uh, plan for a meeting, agenda for a meeting? You know, what are the skills that are required to build an agenda that's really going to work and really going to be effective for producing desired outcomes in a meeting? Um, but I would say that at, at base, um, we need you know, the, the two things that I think that we lack the most are skills for being able to think critically, like we just aren't encouraged to build those skills, and those interpersonal skills, those human interpersonal skills that we need to be able to profoundly hear one another. I have I have to say you're catching me in a week where I'm a little disheartened about all of those things because it seems so um, so much and so basic. But I like what you described um, in 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 those skills needed because it put words on something that I've been thinking about um, in our training of trainers or in our advanced training. Um, Sort of why why do some groups just take off and have no problem? You know what are the skills that those who are struggling really lacking? And you put some good words on it. Um, just sort of having the I guess the clarity of do I understand you? The clarity of do we have common ground or don't we? You know, um, who who gets to decide? Well, it's all it's all very basic stuff, and by that I don't mean simple, just very basic foundational. Uh, yeah. That is really hard. How can people outside of sociocracy or how can, how, how, what are ways of learning that? How, what are ways of um, incorporating that earlier for more people? Oh, you just do education completely differently. <laughs> just. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we do, we actually do have models for this. There are lots of schools that are doing things right or doing a lot of things right. You've heard of things like uh, project based learning. <clears throat> when that's being done really effectively, what, what, what people are, what children are doing together is they're actually learning in these real life settings where they're grappling together with issues and problems. And so they're building those skills naturally through interacting with one another to build knowledge. So, you know, so you just, you provide a place for people to, to learn, a context that like sociocracy, right? Like sociocracy is, is just the ideal um, place for these skills to begin to be built in, and to emerge. It's not so much a labor of saying, as adults, we have to do this to a certain extent, but in childhood, it, it's like learning language. You don't really need to study grammar to learn language when you're a child, right? You study grammar so that you can understand more about the structure of language, but it's not necessary for writing well or, you know, if you've learned your language well, you don't really need to study that thing directly what you but you learn the language well by being embedded in contexts that are constantly demanding that of you that are constantly asking you to stretch yourself not by you know not by you know ex extrinsic motivations or external motivations but by providing environments that make it really fun to build those skills in so that's what we need to we need to do that to our educational systems and to a great extent you know the, the best place for these skills to emerge in adulthood is actually context like sociocratic um, decision-making circles where you just have to build the skills in order to make it work. Unfortunately, if you know, people aren't going to make it all the time simply because a lot of people just really aren't prepared with enough of the nascent pieces to start the process of building the skills, you know, on their own in that complex of a context. I would love for this sort of press pause and give you a chance to talk about Lectica and the approach mm -hmm. Lectica is doing here, because I think it would be interesting for people to hear that, that puzzle piece for those who are not aware of it. Yeah. Well, I, I think I'm lucky in a way because, you know, we do, we do work in both adulthood and K-12, um, but I'm going to talk about adulthood for a few minutes because um, I'm working in an easier space than you are right now, I think, when it comes to the demands on these skills. 
I'm working with typical organizations with typical kinds of structures and trying to help people figure out how do we create little micro environments within the organization where these skills can be allowed to develop. So I'm working with leaders of teams who want to sneak these practices in without getting noticed too much. <laughs> <laughs> and so our expectations are just not nearly as high as the ones that one would have if you're trying to create a sociatic, sociocratic organization from scratch, you know what I mean? Um, but it's been a useful place to be because that's how we've identified all of the things that get in the way and the things that are, op that are opportunities and where good, some good starting places are for people. So we've been able to, to learn a lot in that way. Um, we, we started in the adult space because we were called in by the federal government after 9-11 to help study what went wrong in people's um, communication and decision-making processes. And they had two things that they had kind of invented at that time, two ideas. One was the silo, where you know the organizational parts don't talk to one another, which they felt was really the primary cause of the problems that happened at 9-11, on 9-11. And the other part was what they had coined, this term they coined called VUCA skills, skills you need for working with volatility, um, uh, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And so we set out, we spent six years studying these things and how these skills develop over time. And it turns out that those VUCA skills pretty much the skills that I just started describing to you, they turn out to be those fundamental skills that we should all be learning throughout our whole lives. Uh, they're, they're skills for perspective coordination, um, you know, seeking, taking, coordinating perspectives. They're skills for thinking about, um, you know, where, what, what kind of things are causes. So being able to think of different, um, different aspects of the environment or context in the environment that could be contributing to problems being able to um again not 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 just work collaboratively but to know how much collaboration is appropriate for particular contexts and um being and, and being able to use having a toolkit that you can use to cope with the complexity that's in your environment and many of those tools and skills are the same skills that we include in our virtuous cycle of learning model as fundamental skills that we should be learning across the whole lifespan so we've had an opportunity to both in the K-12 sector and in the adult sector look at how those skills actually are developing over time. And by studying their development over time, we can then do assessments of people's um, performances in the present and help them to see what comes next for them in terms of their learning of those skills. Does that make sense? So our approach is to do diagnostics that help people to um, identify what the skills are, what those things are that are most likely to come next for them. And then we ask them, does that feel juicy? Does that feel interesting? <laughs> does that feel like a stretch? Um, and then help them start to engage in learning practices that will help them build those skills, both as individuals, but also by sneaking in to their teams, certain kinds of activities that will help to build those skills within the teams. And so here I'm talking about iterative processes of all kinds, iterative dynamic steering, um, decision-making processes, um, design thinking type processes, scrum type processes, and I borrow from you guys all the time. <laughs> there's, a, there's a question here in the Q&A tool that as long as I didn't read it, but I just trust, plus it has a, no. Well, um, so one is um, overwhelmed. Um, especially interpersonal um, in the interpersonal domain. Is there something you can um, tell us about that? My, my hunch is that it gets very complex very quickly because it's so so emotionally it ties you in emotionally, maybe more even. I don't know, but you you tell us. So, what kind of overwhelm are we talking about? Just um, general. Well. Um, it, in the question here, it's about interpersonal dynamics, I guess. Um, but yeah. well, I would say, first of all, overwhelm, you know, is an indicator. Hmm. It's information. <laughs> so first, we treat it as information, <laughs> and we try to understand its source. You know, where is it coming from, and not just is it coming from the interpersonal 
stuff that's going on in the room, but what is the interpersonal stuff that's coming going on in the room that's making me have the sense of overwhelm? Where is that dynamic coming from? What, you know, what are the factors that might be involved in creating it? So for example, right now in my organization, we're suffering from a great deal of overwhelm that has to do with growing. Plain and simple, man. I was such a brat with my administrator this morning that I've been embarrassed all day so far. Like I just, I, you know, I have to go and have a chat with him. Um, you know, my behavior deteriorates when I am in distress. So if we don't, if we don't treat overwhelm like it's a, you know, kind of a diagnostic indicator and go after it and try to figure out where it's coming from, it's just going to keep happening. Because, you know, we're not because we're not going to be addressing the source. Um, and usually, you know, one of the things that you have to do when you're having a lot of overwhelm is back off, go slow, you know, slow it down. <laughs> um, stop, stop pushing as hard as you're pushing. But, you know, that's one kind of overwhelm. There are other kinds of overwhelm that might not be addressed, you know, as well in a particular way. So the, the overwhelm could be because there are two people in your organization who both have sick relatives that you're taking care of and they're just not being able to show up. It's as individuals, so. That's another question. What are the different factors that you're looking at if you're doing a role complexity assessment? Huh. So the kind of complexity that we look at is a specific kind of complexity called hierarchical complexity. So it has to do with that one of the first things about it that's, you know, that's relatable is that most organizations have some kind of hierarchy, whether it's um, codified or not. There's some kind of hierarchy in most organizations, um, which means that some people have responsibility for more of the picture than others on some level. So part of what we're looking at is how much of, of the of the whole does this individual have responsibility for? It's 12 That's o'clock. one of the first things that we look at for role complexity. And then we also look at factors like what's the nature of the work? You know, what, what kind of, of activities and, and, and skills are expected of this person in this role? What's the nature of the work? And how does the complexity of that type of work compare to the complexity of other types of work? So that, that plays a, a role. Um, the number of people who that person is interacting with as a peer, the number of people that person is interacting with as a supervisor, those kinds of factors go in as well. So how many people are you responsible for trying to help juggle and, and support? Um, and where people are um, in the overall, you know, existing or organizational structure and the, the size of the organization as a whole and you know, things like factors of that kind things we look at. I'm going to take one more question from this Q&A tool and then I would love it for people to join this conversation and ask their questions themselves in person. Or you can still type in the chat actually if you are somewhere where you don't actually want to go on video right now. But just announcing that that will happen. Because I know uh, Theo's uh, request was to see people breathe. Is that I, what know, I, I like to hear people breathe their faces. I've got yours. That's not yeah. that. I know, but I'm actually very aware of sort of my, of the cue <laughs> that you get from me. Since I'm also looking at the chat, I want you to see people who have, you know, have 100% yeah. of the attention on you and not just 80, 89. <laughs> Um, so this one, I, I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts um, on this one. So it's a long question, but um, it's sweet. In the learning of the learning, how to perceive and process complexities, multi, multi-dimensionalities in ingesting or digesting it all. How important or relevant do you consider motor skills? So movement is complex movement, or rhythm builds, um, okay, as well as singing skills. I'm asking that because I observed in a Campbell community based on Rudolf Steiner, um, that one time we were utterly stuck in coming to consent. We had a singing and moving fortnight. The outcome was awesome. Listening, empathy, patience, enabling best decisions taking place. Your reaction. Well, you know, I, I did use the word embodied earlier. So uh, clearly, um, you know, I really see um, our minds as connected. 
I don't, I don't really think of thinking of something that's really separate from feeling or emotion or that the physical experience of being in the world. So naturally, I'm going to think that the, the best kind of learning and growing environments, you know, incorporate many modalities, numerous modalities. But I wouldn't force people to do any of them. <laughs> so that would be my, you know, when it comes to children, you know, we might, I, I might say, okay, well, you have to do something that's physical and you have to do something that relates to music and you have to do something that relates to this category of things. But you choose, you know, make it, make it something that you love and that you want to pursue and you care about. Um, because the same things don't work for everybody. Um, there's, there's quite a bit of evidence around this, and I'd like to talk a little bit about evidence. Um, we have, personally have evidence that programs, educational programs, that, that are, we call them integrated programs, where they're actually intentionally trying to integrate all of these aspects into the educational system, into the educational process. Those programs, especially if they're programs that also include lots of virtuous cycling and as part of the, the kind of learning that they're doing is virtuous cycling so that they are actually applying everything they know and reflecting about outcomes along the way on a regular basis. Um, the children in those programs can be up to five years ahead of children in conventional programs by the time that they reach the age of 17 or 18 developmentally. So we know that learning in this embodied way, we know that learning in this way in which we're touching on all aspects of what it is to be human um, plays a huge role in helping us to develop properly as human beings. And we just think of this as the appropriate development. This is what's possible for all of us. Um, that, that, you know, that reaching our full potential happens because we get to engage the world in all of these ways. Uh, so that's a, that's a really, really um, important finding from, from the research. And then we have little bits of evidence along the way where we discovered early on that um, junior high school students who hadn't actually spent much time in the physical world, running around, bouncing balls, um, playing with you know, mechanical things, throwing balls, um, jumping rope, you know, all of those physical activities that children typically engage in, couldn't learn physics. They just couldn't get it. And, and I remember when I was a kid, when I took my first mechanics course, feeling the answers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, we quickly put two and two together. So much of what we are capable of learning as human beings, we cannot learn without the, the motor base skills base for them. And one of the things that really scares me about modern society is how much less our children are engaged in the physical world and the social world, the active physical social world. Um, my grandchildren haven't had an electronic device yet. My granddaughter is 11. I mean, they're just in the world, you know? <laughs> I'm sort of on my mind taking my, my sort of my one line thing is of summary of what stands out to me right now is that you that our brains are built to learning optimally and that fun and what feels good is sort of um, showing us the way because that is that's is that a fair summary? It, well, it is, but it's a, it's a special kind of fun. It's a fun with pain. Yes. So, you know, I mean, learning should, we should not be trying to make learning an experience where there is no discomfort. That's bad. That would be, and people are doing stuff like that. And it does not produce healthy human beings. <laughs> um, we want to create, we want to create environments for children where the amount of discomfort they experience is in the safe range. You know, that's in the range that, allows them to continue to feel like they have some mastery over their environment, but that challenges them and, you know, helps, it builds all sorts of things to have these discomforts. I mean, when I was 10 years old, we moved to North Carolina and, and I was completely discriminated against, like totally the teacher, all the students, they had signs saying, Yankee, go home. I went home crying every day. It made me a compassionate person. <laughs> you know, it wasn't too much for me. Um, so we don't want to wrap, you know, wrap our children up and prevent them from having any discomfort, but we want them to 
be in a safe enough environment so that you know that they, they when they experience those discomforts that the resources are there for them to pull on and we we want them to continue to fall down <laughs> so you know and, and experience the feedback from the environment that the rich feedback from the environment from making mistakes or not getting things quite right or having to iterate constantly because this is a skill and you're never ever really going to get there you know it's always going to be something in front of you with some carrot dangling there i'm going to do what i promised to do and that is um bring people into the room if they raise their hand so i'm going to lower all hands real quick and then you can on while while you're finding that i want to say one one sort of sort of related thing actually i find it very related and that is that I love how much sort of school education choices, but even parenting, you know, comes in quite a bit because that always bubbles to the top for me because group decision, not only is a family and organization, obviously, you know, so all those things like good process, making decisions together should really start in families. Um, but also because so many, just so many learnings I have from governance carry over to parenting and vice versa. It just seems to be basically, um, basically the same thing. And if you want to say something about that, you're welcome to. Well, but there will be people coming into the into the room, so that's going to be a little disruptive for a second. But you can speak while that happens. See hey, Sheila. So, here. Move, raise your hand. If you want to be in this room, by the way, what I should have said before I did that is by raising your hand and coming into the main room, you are consenting to be in the, in the video recording of this, unless you turn your video off. So I still see 33 people who don't want to join our party here, which is totally fine. And just know that if you are not finding the button, there you go more. If you're not finding the button, you can ask me in the chat. Um, we're going to transition into something like a conversation here. Mm -hmm. This is a slow tool. It's a really one by one tool. And it might be that you know, you should be. All right. I am aware that we still have open questions. And do we have, do we have Ben here? Has Ben here? No, Ben is not here. Sheila, you had a question. Do you want to ask it live? You were asking about the federal government following, following 9-11 changes and so on. I'm, I'm sorry. I just got in. I didn't know I had to click, click something to, to, to hear the audio. So I heard, the I heard you ask the tail end of my question, Chad. Yes, I'm asking whether you want to ask it here live. Sure. Um, you talked about the, you were called in by the federal government after 9-11, and I'm curious if the, your work with them resulted in the government making any changes in how it does, how it does things. It was the intelligence community, and we were told nothing. We did the research, <laughs> but we were, we'd have, I have no idea. Black box. <laughs> lack of lack of feedback, lack of them following the process that you're recommending to them, right? <laughs> That's right. But we, you know, we came away with the uh, the a few assessments that we had built during the time, and we're able to take those into the world and keep learning. So it worked out well for us in the end. But my curiosity is enormous. <laughs> what I really would love to know what happened. Hold on, I, I would like to still do the one from the chat and then, and Marta, I do see you. Um, Patrick, you had a question here. Do, do you see a tool or do you want me to read it? Um, it was about it's sort of a um, role of complexity assessment. Um, would it be different in a non-hierarchical context from in a hierarchical context? Do you want to say more, Patrick? Um, yeah, you already mentioned it basically. So um, yeah, I was interested, I was intrigued to hear that you're looking at the hierarchical complexity or the, the, con the hierarchical context also maybe of a, of a, of a person's role. Um, so in a, in a, in a, holoc a holocratic environment, which is very similar to sociocracy in many ways, uh, 
usually people have multiple roles and there's no hierarchy of, of people anymore. There's a hierarchy inherent in, in the work of the organization. And I'm curious uh, if, if, if your way of looking at this would change in any significant way uh, if you were to conduct a, a role complexity assessment in such an environment, because it's a key question for us. Like, how do you get a good person role fit? We're look, we, look, we look at the we look at the hierarchy in an organization because it's a really easy way to be able to see the hierarchy of to to be able to infer the hierarchy of tasks that a person is likely to be you know responsible for. In a, a flatter organization, we have to look more directly at the hierarchy of tasks of the specific kinds of tasks that they're expected to perform. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a diff, it's the same measurement approach but looking, looking at things more granular, granularly. It's more expensive to do, too. Because you have mm -hmm. to. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. So, Marta, I think I would like to ask you next to yes, um, this way. OK, thank you. Well, thank you, Ted and Dr. Theo, about this conversation. I'm loving it. Uh, sorry for my English. I'm from Brazil. I try to do my best ah. and it will be challenging and funny at the same time, just for me to go on. Um, my question is about what do you think in your experience as a researcher that are the main um, reasons why organizations and groups do not join sociocracy, have this resistance? There's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of contributing causes here. Um, they have no desire to being one of them. Like they don't see any value in it. it doesn't look appealing. Um, they don't have any skills for doing it, so they wouldn't feel comfortable doing it. They already have existing structures and systems that would actually be hostile to sociocratic practices. Um, I, yeah, there's just there's just any number of issues, and and in large organizations that are more well established, I don't think there's much hope of being able to come in through the front door. Um, you know, one big reason why you shouldn't try to do a sociocracy in an existing organization is because you can't get consent, and I don't think it. I don't think. I don't think you can possibly succeed with a consent-based system when you don't start with consent. I just don't think it can happen. So um, we, you know, our approach with organizations is to infect them with practices and to try to do this. And we're trying to figure out where the leverage points are that will help people build the skills and predispositions that will lead to gradual evolution within organizations. Because I think that's the only way you can legitimately get there. And even if they make a little progress, it, it really positively affects people's lives. Thank you. The queue is empty. So now if you want to speak and you're in this room, oh, actually um, somebody wants to come. Um, Marta's English is excellent. We have a, a team member from Brazil who's <laughs> Ben, it's actually good you came here because I didn't, I, for, sorry, a little bit of um, logistics here. I misclicked your, your question and then it was gone. So do you want to ask your question um, verbally, Ben? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, working in a community setting more than a specific organization um, in uh, Pittsburgh, um, we've got a very vastly different um, learning levels at um, the adult age. Um, and if we distinguish um, people who have good learning capacity from people that don't have good learning capacity within essentially the community organization, this makes a lot of sense for a learning organization. Um, but we end up with a PR problem 
um, in that we're going to have black people on one side of the room and white people on the other side of the room. Um, so maybe at the worst, that's a PR problem and we need to figure out how the organization then can transfer experience that we need from one group um, and integrate that um, throughout. Um, but also just as a general question, when we've got vastly different learning capacities, trying to grapple with a communal level problem that some people just don't have the capacity to understand. Um, maybe some wisdom in, in how to move forward in that? Well, I would, you know, I would argue that everybody has a way of understanding the problems that they face. Right. And that every way of understanding the problems they face is a legitimate way of understanding. So that's the as a starting place. Um, but when it comes to people being able to work together effectively, to to come in, uh, because there's a natural desire for people to want to at least spend some of their time and some of their interactions in places where they feel understood, where they're feeling understood by peers. So. Um, I don't have any experience with working person, you know, directly in, in situations like this where I've been consciously trying to work on this issue myself. Um, but, but I would think that if you start from everybody's perspective is real and legitimate, and everybody also deserves an opportunity to have times when they get to be with peers, that you might be able to come up with solutions that would allow both of those things, you know, it, 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 with, that would allow for times when people are working together as an, as an entire group or in very heterogeneous groups, but also times when they have an opportunity to work in groups that are more like peer groups so that you can satisfy both of those things. And one of the ways that that's often done in educational contexts is also to, um, you know, to, to uh, encourage people who have skills that other people don't have to become mentors within within the organization and, you know, work with other people in mentoring kind of capacity, but not all the time. I know Donnie has something he would like to say. Thanks, Ted. Thanks, Dr. Dawson. I'm calling in from Egypt, where I'm on a year-long contract uh, with a 700-person um, organization, helping them introduce sociocracy, among many other things. And one of the things I wanted to share uh, for your reflections, uh, two things, in fact, dealing with uh, people that heterogeneity um, across an, uh, the group, one thing we found really effective is to add in to our agenda, um, a section, and sometimes even twice, which is, what are you learning? And as the facilitator of um, the meeting, it really allows me to work out, are people in the Goldilocks zone or not? Um, so much so that we even put it once in the middle of a meeting um, and at the end. So we had two, what are you learning moments? And tying into that, one thing that I found over many years works uh, really well is to ensure that in that question uh, period, um, in fact, in any meeting period, to have the silence built in there adds in that capacity for the people with more introverted tendencies to deepen their learning as well. So putting those out there for... Uh, That's right. And, and you can ask the question and they can answer it for themselves as well. I like that. And you know what I might add to that? If it was me, I'd play around with adding to it. What would you like to learn next? Yeah, just to get people thinking about learning is something that is ongoing. I think I'm going to try that. <laughs> yeah, I'm totally intrigued by that too. <laughs> Though I have, a, I have to admit, I have a, maybe that's a matter of practice because I'm, if you'd ask me, for example, what are you learning right now? Like, it's like, I don't know. I wonder if that's if you are being asked a question more often, it's something you can access easy, more easily. Uh, I'm guessing maybe. D Donnie, what have you found on that? Yes. Yeah, we we find that adding prompts in works really well. So, for example, you might say, "What are you learning right now about yourself? About how you relate to others? About the content? About what you knew? About what you didn't know? Like prompts like that, and then giving it 20, 30 seconds of silence before." anyone can start sharing just allows people to drop in and then also if someone 
doesn't have something coming up, it's an opportunity for me to go and connect with that person and see what's happening there. Is it a outside the Goldilocks zone or is it just they didn't understand the question? Or as you said, uh, Ted, is it something where they're, um, they, the process isn't working for them itself? So. No, you're reminding me of something that I had intended to talk about directly, and that is that, why well, I touched on it in the slides. Sociocracy is a perfect place for learning. All of those processes that you're doing in those meetings are excellent places to be called in. They're excellent places for people to learn how to do that kind of reflection almost continuously. Um, and what we, one of the things, the ways that we teach vCall is as uh, micro vCalling, where you're literally trying to, you know, I would say you're like trying to suck the learning juice out of every moment, uh, where you get into a habit of mind, where you're constantly asking yourself questions like that one. You know, so what just happened here? What did I learn? Um, you know, what comes next? What just happened here? What did I learn? What comes next? So you could actually encourage people to adopt these kinds of things as practices. And you can also, you know, integrate the reflection, that kind of reflection about what just happened and where do we go next into, you know, what's actually happening in a meeting around decision, a decision that's being made or around some kind of activity that's taking place in order to, and I think we could, you could even do, we can even do more of that in, within the context of sociocratic practices. And um, William. Uh, I'm working on developing a labor force uh, learning program, essentially. And what I've found is a lot of times I, I show them what we have to do, and then I ask them what's coming up for them or where they're at. And then, you know, sometimes they're thinking about things, you know, even like stuff that happened yesterday or stuff that happened at their house, and they're not really there in the moment with us. So then sometimes you have to process through that. I've, I've dealt with a lot of relationship issues where people come and they had a problem with their girlfriend or their boyfriend or something. And just even talking about five minutes about that sometimes gives them the space to then come back and focus more on uh, what, we're, what we're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And by laying out the goals up front, which you guys uh, have spoke about, I show them how I would do it and then kind of let them learn on their own a little bit because I also learn a lot of different ways. I would never think of some of the ways that people do things. And I tell them that they're like, Oh, is this wrong? I'm like, no, I would have never done it that way, but that's just because I've never, I don't think like you, but now I've learned another way to do this that I didn't even know was possible to begin with. Nice. And those are all great moments for be calling <laughs> or, or you know, for doing that reflective moment. And it, I, the, I put so much emphasis on this reflective moment. Let me explain. Let me explain a little bit about why that's so important and why I go on, bang on and on about it. As adults, um, if we don't do that ourselves, our unconscious brain does it for us. And your unconscious brain is probably going to draw conclusions from an encounter that are not quite the ones that you would want it to draw. So the, the reflective moment is basically a moment in which we're talking to our neural network and saying, uh, 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 this is the way I want to remember this. <laughs> this is what I want to take home from this. And so you're participating in networking your brain. And what that does over time is you do it again and again and again and again and again, especially in, in, you know, in the moment, in the moment learning contexts, it builds what's called a robust intuition. So it, it builds a, a fast brain that can make decisions quickly when you need them, or that can draw conclusions quickly when you need to, to move fast. Um, and, and it does it in a way that you can rely upon rather than in a way that is misinformed by default settings in your brain. Well, I love the term robust intuition. Uh, now I'm I'm totally hooked on that. That's that's um, okay. It's not mine. I didn't invent it. Wow, but it's there's, <laughs> there's more to that. Um, this, yeah. Okay. Now now I want to learn about that. Okay. Looking at the time, 
Um, here's what I would like to do. I would like to formally close because I like having a clean closing so people can, you know, leave and go off their day if they um, slot it this time and something else after without feeling awkward about it. Um, and then I'm not going to kick anybody out. So we'll still be here. I'll stop recording and um, we'll see what happens. So yes, good. Or do you want? Do you want to say? You of course have the have the um, choice to have the last word. Do you want to add something right now? Something that you want? Did you just offer the last word to me? Yes, I did. Who else would it be? Oh, wow, I don't have to compete for it. That's what you're saying. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> right. You don't have to compete. Everybody else does, but you don't. <laughs> well, I invite everybody to you know to to take a look at all of the resources that we have available on our website. But one of the missions of our organization is to produce knowledge, and we've been you know building as much building knowledge as fast as we can when it comes to to learning. Um, and I'm always interested, you know, if if any of you are working in contexts where you'd like to do a little experimenting around some of these questions about learning, that we're always interested in the possibility of of learning more by working closely with, with organizations that are trying to, um, to do things that we like. <laughs> and we like sociocracy. So, thank you for coming. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you. The recording will be available. And um, stay and hang out if that's what you want to do. I'm going to actually, we have this little tradition that is, I'm realizing, not accessible in the webinar version. Unmute yourself if you know how to do this. And we wave and say bye-bye because it's sweeter than just hitting a button. So unmute yourself if you're in the... Bye. 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 Bye.